You know, my name is Jonathan Lande. I'm a senior correspondent for Knight Ritter, covering national security affairs. Okay, and how many um, newspapers is Knight Ritter? 31. And okay, plus, okay, hold on. Um, when I'm going to be uh, asking questions, if you, you want me to answer in a full sentence, as if, yeah. Uh, we have 31 newspapers, but also we own, co-own, uh, the Knight Ritter Tribune news service uh, that I think feeds something like 350 other newspapers around the world. And so the stories get quite wide distribution. Okay, great. And um, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell me, when you come in each day, where do you get your news from? Uh, you know, I, where do I get, I'm, I'm following uh, developing sources and developing leads off stuff that I've been reporting now for 18 months on the questionable intelligence that was used by the administration to make its case for the war in Iraq. And so I'll follow developments on a, that are breaking, you know, ordinary news developments. But most of what I've been doing for the past 18 months, except for a three, months, three to four month break in the middle where I actually went to Iraq and covered the war, um, has been devoted to uh, covering the intel story. Okay. And um, do you read the New York Times or Washington Post to see what other news? Sure. I mean, I like to know. Uh, what else other people are reporting, but on this story, uh, pretty much we're alone. And so uh, my real only concern is to make sure that uh, we're covering, uh, we've covered stuff that other people are, are covering or reporting on, that we stay ahead. Okay, great. And um, how have you seen the White House influence the news coverage uh, leading up to the war in Iraq? Well, I have to put the caveat on that I was only here until January uh, of '03, uh, and then I went to Kurdistan, um, northern Iraq. But up to that point, my impression was that virtually all major media uh, echoed uh, what the White House was saying uh, about Iraq and its alleged weapons of mass destruction program, uh, its ties to terrorists. You'll even hear uh, a lot of mass media back then echoing allegations uh, that Saddam uh, was involved in 9-11 uh, and not just echoing them but reporting them and this was nothing, this, this wasn't a specific charge that was made by the White House but if you look at the way they were dealing with the, that question there certainly were enough people uh, very senior in the administration who were very happy to imply that without actually saying it and they were helped because a there was media out there reporting it and b there were their allies uh, talking heads here in Washington uh, who were very much in favor of a preemptive uh, attack on Iraq who were also uh, echoing these allegations some of whom are still are and they were getting on television on a regular basis they were getting on radio they were making speeches they were writing op-ed uh, articles uh, and nobody was questioning what they were saying, and I think there were a reason, number of reasons why. First of all, everybody who covered this issue for any length of time, who, were involved, who was involved in this issue for any length of time, everybody believed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. The terrorism thing, I would, I would put to the side, but as far as WMD went, I think that there, it was almost universally assumed, assumed that he had uh, concealed uh, weapons that the UN inspectors hadn't found. And I have to count myself in among that group until I began and my partners began reporting the stories that we began reporting in September of 02, 01, no, Two. se to, September of 02, yes, sorry, um, uh, about uh, people within, uh, quoting people within the government who were themselves questioning what the administration was saying about the intelligence that the United States had. Okay, great. And did, do you, did you see a pattern of um, when uh, reporters were misreporting items, they weren't being corrected, even if it was suiting their agenda, and if it wasn't suiting it, their agenda, was there a certain amount of flack that was given? Well, uh, you're using a, the, the word agenda is a kind of a, in a, you're using it in a very broad sense in that you're basically implying that most reporters had agendas. I don't believe that. Um, I do believe there were some 
major news organizations that had agendas. Well, I mean and, the Bush administration. But you're talking about the Bush administration's agenda. I don't think anybody questioned it. Many people did not. Most people did not question it, so they didn't go back to correct their reporting. And I think there was another. There was another issue at play here, and that was the effect on of 9/11 on the general U.S. psyche, which was, uh, you know, we've got to come together, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, it's us against them. And uh, if you start questioning what the government is saying, uh, you jeopardize you could end up jeopardizing your readership, uh, your viewership ratings, uh, your access to official sources. Uh, there are all sorts of considerations, I think, that went into the f contributing to this failure, and it was a failure, of most major media to delve behind, uh, in a meaningful way, uh, the administration's rationale for going to war and the intelligence that it was using to make its case. Unlike us, uh, because we start, well, when we started he hearing from people uh, questions about people within the government raising questions and concerns about the arguments that the administration was making uh, and saying the intelligence isn't there to support what they're saying, we began to really focus on that question. And what we were doing, we're talking not to senior officials who were part of the political, who, who shared the political agenda, but, but people who, the hands-on uh, sort of mid-level, uh, very some senior people too, very senior people too, who were dealing with this issue and had serious questions about what was going on. And that, what, what the first reports that you started to come out were in um, September and early October, right? Yeah, I think the first story that I wrote uh, that kind of got the ball rolling was a story, I think it was in September of two, and the lead was something like uh, senior officials with access to top secret intelligence say there, there has been no alarming increase in the threat from Saddam Hussein detected, uh, and we were off to the races. And so. Um, Judith Miller and Michael Gordon had their two aluminum tube stories. The Washington Post had one aluminum tube story in the uh, uh, Institute for Science and Security Studies, uh, or the uh, ISIS, had another study. And then you had your report on October um, 4th. Had you been working on it, or did you, on that day when you got the CIA report, start working on it? No, I mean, I hadn't been working. I was still looking at other questions. Uh, one of the major questions we were looking at was how much um, of the suspect intelligence was influencing the military planning, and it turns out it was in quite a, quite a few ways. But that was the first time I wrote a story about that, and I think what leapt out at me, as opposed to other journalists, was this uh, acknowledgement in this CIA uh, public uh, report on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program that disclosed a uh, dispute over the nature of these tubes. The rest of the report was just everything else we had been hearing for years about uh, what was suspected uh, in terms of Saddam's weapons. Um, but this for me was a real telltale signal that we were on the right track in terms of our general reporting theme, which was questionable intelligence, and it turns out that um, uh, there was a dispute not only about the tubes, but there was a dispute over the Niger uranium and a dispute over the nature of Saddam's uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle program, uh, over his nuclear program, stuff that eventually we reported out, a lot of it for the first time. Uh, but this, for me, was really the first real eye-opener confirmation that we were really on to something. Now I guess um, as your job as a reporter is to, to do these reports and you get them printed and then you kind of sit back and see how it affects the kind of uh, the dialogue and the debate. Um, from your perspective, um, were the reports that you were making, were they not getting into the mainstream um, thought of America and if so, why not? <sighs> Um, not really, because Knight Ritter is not, doesn't own newspapers. Okay, well, just start again with the, um, 
kind of yeah. recap over the sentiments. Yeah. yeah. Our stuff wasn't really getting headline play throughout the United States because Knight Ritter doesn't own newspapers in New York and Washington, these very important key centers of influence uh, in the United States. They were getting noticed uh, because they're, they're, they were being published, uh, not just in Knight Ritter newspapers, but other newspapers that subscribe to the Knight Ritter Tribune service. Uh, and then it was be, they were being noticed also to some extent here in Washington because um, the Pentagon every day does this compendium early in the morning of national security stories called the early bird. And it's circulated, it's a very good compendium uh, of what the press is reporting that day on national security topics and it gets circulated throughout the government. And so some of our stuff was starting to get noticed. Uh, but still we weren't, there weren't any major, you know, people weren't really paying enormous amounts of attention. Uh, in fact, the mainstream press continued reporting that he had weapons of mass destruction and there were possible ties to terrorism and the administration was also, you know, pursuing that, those lines very aggressively as it sought to turn public opinion in favor of a war uh, against Saddam. Um, and uh, it was one of the more frustrating parts of doing this. At the same time, I mean, we're not in this to gain recognition for ourselves. We're in this because it's our job as reporters, uh, for better or for worse, constitutionally, to hold the government accountable for its actions and what it's telling the American people. And that's what we were doing. We were doing our job. One of the more important facets of that is, um, I mean, I think one of the major reasons we got into it in the first place is because um, Knight Ritter owns the three papers that are, uh, that serve the bases from which most of the ground troops who invaded Iraq were drawn from. Uh, this is uh, the paper in Macon, Georgia, paper in Lexington, Kentucky, and paper in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and my boss, uh, John Walcott, you know, said to us, you know, we have a special responsibility uh, because we own those papers, because the families of soldiers who were being sent, the loved ones, the uh, daughters, the sons, the wives, uh, are going to look to our papers to inform them of not only what's going on in terms of the making of the case for war, but the war itself and the ramifications that a war in Iraq could have uh, for them and their loved ones. And so that for us was a really special consideration in all of this. Okay. Did you want to tell me something? Okay. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about the, um, the difference between uh, investigative reporting and beat reporting and where you fit into that? Well, I kind, of straddle the, uh, I kind of straddle the line between beat reporting and investigative reporting because national security issues are probably the most opaque that are dealt with by the government because that's just the nature of the beast. And therefore, to be able to report on national security issues, you have to be able to do investigative reporting, uh, because obviously this, these are these are issues that that the government doesn't really want to talk about a lot. Um, and so I'm kind of mixed the two together, and you know I write daily I, I write daily reports too based on sort of what's happening that day, uh, stuff on the hill. You know I covered the war. I spent three months in Kurdistan uh, uh, reporting on not just the preparations for uh, the invasion of Iraq by the Americans, uh, but also the Iraqi opposition and what they were doing up there in terms of trying to get their own act together uh, for post-Saddam, uh, as well as uh, the operations against Ansar al-Islam, the, the extremist Islamic group that was based up in Kurdistan. And so, you know, I was reporting every day or trying to on, on daily developments. Uh, and I do the same thing here. Uh, but in trying to get to the bottom of the use of the intelligence uh, for the justification of the war, uh, that requires a lot of investigative techniques. And that means, um, in a lot of ways, you have to sort of be an intelligence analyst. So a lot of the most important stories I've done 
haven't relied on secret sources or leaked documents. Uh, there's a lot out there in the public domain that merely needs to be scrubbed and read over. Uh, and when you do it for a second time, you know, the first time you hear a speech, you kind of report on the speech uh, and you put it aside. Um, what I've been doing since all of this really started bubbling up is going back and rereading speeches and statements. And when you go back and do that, uh, uh, then you, things hit you uh, that, that didn't hit you the first time because when you wrote it, when you listened to it the first time, there wasn't, you were reporting on, I was reporting on the questionable intelligence, but it wasn't really a huge issue. And so a lot of stuff you kind of jumped over back then. Now, you know, I've gone back and reread virtually every speech that Vice President Cheney's made, that the President has made, that Colin Powell has made, uh, news conferences, uh, uh, white papers. There's a lot out there that you can do without having to develop secret sources and getting people to leak documents to you. Beyond that, uh, I think a lot of the mainstream press has gotten fat and lazy. Uh, and and they've, they've gotten to a point where they've assumed that they're just going to be given stuff. They've gotten used to being given stuff because this is the way this town works. Oh, you know, got something coming out, I'll leak it to so and so, and they'll put it in the paper, and it'll get a lot of attention, and then we'll have a, bit, you know, we'll have more people at our news conference, and so, so that tends to dilute um, uh, entrepreneurship and 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 investigate and the desire to do investigative stuff because it's hard, it's tough, it's time consuming, um, and and I think, you know, as I said, a lot of very large media, television, and newspapers have just gotten used to getting handouts and therefore have lost the fire in the belly. In our case, you know, we don't have access to the senior officials that these other large media have had, do have, and it required us to scramble but it, it, it was good in a way because we were able to sort of go below their level to the level where there wasn't this political agenda where people were truly bothered by what was going on and find people who were willing to talk to us. So do you think if you worked for either the New York Times or a major television show that you wouldn't have been able to do, uh, develop the same type of sources and do the same type of reporting that you were able to do? No. I don't think I'd be able to do the same kind of reporting that I've been able to do if I worked for um, television, absolutely, because in today's television news rarely put stories on that they can't put pictures to. And a lot of stories can't, are so complicated and, um, and, and technical that you can't put pictures to them and therefore they're not going to get on air. Uh, if I had been working for a, an organization, a news organization, that had been publishing stories that essentially substantiated the administration's case for war, I doubt very much whether stories that called into question the other stories that my publication was printing would get printed. So editorially, they would have been um, squelched. Yeah, because it would have meant, well, wait a minute. We reported last week that it was like this, and now you're saying, well, that was bogus. That was, was bogus information, or there was questionable intelligence. And now not only are you calling into question the story that we published last week, but the credibility of the reporter who reported that story. and and. I don't think that would have gone over very well. Do you know of any instances of other uh, fellow reporters who were on the same beat as you or report, trying to report the same type of stuff but were editorially not? No. No, because all I know is that, that we, my bosses have been nothing but as supportive as any journalist would ever want their boss to be. Uh, we have been told this is the most important story that we could possibly cover and go for it. Do what you got to do. 
because uh, the decision to go to war, to take the country into war, there is no graver decision that a president can make than to take the country into war. And given what we have found in our reporting uh, in terms of the questions raised about the rationale that the American people were given, we've been told just keep keep doing it. Now, if, if you were, um, you went to um, Iraq in uh, January, right? If you were in the United States, do you have any, I guess it's more hypothetical, but what type of beats would you have been looking at? Oh, I would have still been on the, the Iraq. Oh, there was no other story. It was Iraq, you know, 24-7. Any specific issues as far as the tubes or Niger or... I did do reporting on Niger when I came back. In fact, I broke the story that said this, the CIA had informed the White House about its reservations about the alleged uranium shopping trip that <laughs> Iraq had made in Niger ten months before the president trotted it out in his State of the Union address. So I was still, even despite that three-month break, I was still able to, to get back into it fairly quickly. And actually, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way because a lot of the time I spent up in the North was with the Iraqi National Congress uh, and the Iraqi opposition, and I was able to watch that part of this whole um, this whole thing um, and get a sense of the people who were involved, uh, particularly the group that was providing uh, a lot of the questionable intelligence defectors who have since been determined to be fabricators or exaggerators. I was able to, to, to cover them um, and to experience, in fact, uh, in instances where I think I was misled, not by the Iraqi National Congress, but I believe by some of the Kurdish officials who were up there uh, and, and the drum they were banging about uh, al-Qaeda and Ansar al-Islam um, now seems based on intelligence since the end of the war that while there were connections between Ansar and al-Qaeda uh, they were probably a lot more tenuous than I was being made to believe uh, and other journalists were being made to believe when we were in Kurdistan. Yeah. Hmm. So um, looking back at, uh, let's see, the um, um, I'm going to go back to the uh, um, Iraqi National Congress and the, what can you say, well I guess um, first the, um, the links between um, giving weapons of mass destruction to terrorists to attack the United States and kind of speak to what the, uh, the CIA has since come out. Well actually the fact is that the CIA came out before the war with questions about that particular assertion by the administration. Uh, a um, letter... Oh, I'm kidding. when you say that particular assertion, oh, can sorry. you just repeat it? Um, in fact, uh, the CIA itself uh, disclosed its own disagreement with the administration's assertions about Saddam being capable of giving weapons of mass destruction to terrorist groups. Uh, in uh, a letter that part of a letter to the former chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Bob Graham, and I think it was in November of 2002, uh, CIA Director George Tennant said, actually it's our judgment that, that this would be, that, that Saddam wouldn't do this except uh, under, you know, as a, as a very, very last resort desperate, desperation move. Uh, that uh, that uh, we don't believe uh, that he would do this except uh, if he was about to go down and he wanted to uh, take as many people down with him as he could, particularly Americans, he might, in, under those circumstances, uh, provide weapons of mass destruction to uh, extremists like Al-Qaeda. And in fact, if you look at uh, the national intelligence estimate that at that time, in October of 2002, uh, was, class was still classified, uh, it says the very same thing. It says we don't believe. We, we, it says something along the lines that we judge 
that, that if he decided to use weapons of mass destruction against the United States and its allies, he would probably do it using Iraqi uh, intelligence officers, that he would have them do it. And only as a last, very last desperate desperation move would he provide weapons of mass destruction to terrorists. And, that, and, and the reason is because uh, that he, would be, he would be afraid that they could be traced back to him and that he didn't want to take that risk. Um, so the administration had been given this, this judgment by the CIA uh, as early as October of 2002, uh, and yet none of their statements reflect that judgment. Instead, their statements continue to hammer on this question of whether uh, this, this, this danger of Saddam providing uh, terrorists with, we with weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there, there's, there was a question about what the administration was saying by the, raised by the CIA itself before the war. Um, <coughs> one uh, aspect of this whole um, the, the campaign for the Bush administration to sell the war in Iraq was using the UN, United Nations weapons inspections process as, in a way, the international legal justification for the war. Uh, what is your impression of how the Bush administration treated the inspections process? Well, there's no doubt in my mind, because uh, I did some reporting on this, that Saddam was using the sanctions to enrich himself and to raise money outside of UN control for use in whatever he chose to use it for. And it seems now that he was mostly using it to maintain the loyalty of his Ba'ath Party. Uh, you know, with privileges and houses and property and, and visits to palaces, uh, which were really like, you know, I've been in a bunch of them, luxury playgrounds uh, with incredible swimming pools and bars and, and what have you, uh, and gyms, uh, vast dining rooms, that these were kind of rewards for loyalty. And, and I think a lot of the money that he was making uh, illegally off the sanctions were going to, were, was going to that, was going to other things to support the regime, it seems quite unlikely now that it was being used to build weapons of mass destruction, which have not been found, at least not up to this point. Um, but uh, I think that in retrospect, I think there are people like David Kay, uh, the former uh, head of uh, the U.S. weapons inspection effort post Saddam who are saying seems like the UN inspection regime worked um, that it in fact had by the time it, uh, Saddam uh, basically threw them out in 1998 had in fact succeeded in ferreting out most most of his really bad stuff uh, they had they had destroyed the nuclear program uh, and they had basically uncovered and destroyed most of uh, the chemical and biological uh, uh, programs. There were still pro there were still elements of the programs that hadn't been uncovered. Lots of paper, the expertise, missiles. They were working on missiles uh, illegally, uh, illegal missiles. But on the whole, I think a lot of people will agree now. A lot of experts will agree now that that on the whole, the UN inspection regime succeeded in what it was designed to do. Do you think that the Bush administration used the UN as a pretext for the war? Uh, that's not for me to say. Uh, I don't think you can, I mean, a pretext, and certainly the Bush administration cited uh, this long litany of UN resolutions that Saddam had failed to, um, to abide by, and there's no doubt that he had failed to abide by these resolutions. Maybe there was not full uh, full and complete disclosure. There wasn't. Uh, but the, the whole question is what he hadn't disclosed, what he still had, how much of a threat was that to the United States and Saddam's neighbors? And it seems now that wasn't much. Uh, there's not much you can do about the storehouse of knowledge they, they had accumulated, particularly the, 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 the competencies of their scientists. That's knowledge gained and not lost. But in practical terms, it doesn't seem now, having had U.S. troops scouring the place for almost a year, 
that he had these vast stockpiles that the Bush administration accused him of having, uh, and that in fact uh, very uh, prominent news organizations uh, reported him as having based on interviews with so-called defectors. On uh, February 24th, uh, Newsweek broke that uh, Hussein Kamal back in 1995 had told the, the weapon, the UN and the CIA and MI6 that he had that they had destroyed all the weapons of mass destruction. Did you see that report? That that um, transcript uh, of an interview between uh, Hussein Kamal and Rolf Akeas, and there, I think there was a Russian. The the, the, the it was uh, the UN's. Ru he was a Russian nuclear expert, I believe. Um, has been available on the internet, uh, and when you read through it, absolutely, there's Hussein Kamal saying, "I ordered everything destroyed." Um, and if you apply some logic to that whole incident, uh, the fact is that Hussein Kamal, um, it was in his interest uh, to have said the opposite, because here he was trying to get political asylum in Jordan or the United States or wherever he could and what defectors usually do is pump up their own importance, pump up what they know so that they are of m value to the people they're talking to. Uh, in this case he basically said, hey I destroyed it all and people who were interviewing say, well what value is he anymore? He's basically told us what he knows. Um, and so I, I think that in retrospect if you look at what he was saying there was no reason for him to lie. He did disclose uh, and uh, the location of this treasure trove of documentation on biological weapons uh, that uh, were on his chicken farm, the so-called chicken farm documents. Um, having done that, he then says there wasn't anything else. So in my mind, in retrospect, and a lot of this is in retrospect, I say, well, what interest did he have in lying about that? He his interest was in actually to string things out, to make it sound as if he knew where lots of other stuff was so that they would offer him protection, that they would offer him asylum. And in fact, they didn't, and he went back to Iraq and was killed. Well, even at the, at the time though, uh, this late February, February 24th, when this transcript was made publicly available, and you have the administration using Hussein Kamal by name as this defector and, and all this talk about we have to talk to the scientists and the defectors and then this transcript becomes available. Do you think the media or uh, somehow this should have been more well known? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, it still wasn't even known uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly when this came out um, but I believe that Vice President Cheney made a speech um, that kicked off the real drive to war. I believe it was at a Veterans of Foreign War convention in August of 02, where he, and this is the speech in which he talks about, uh, some of us are sure he's reconstituted his nuclear weapons program. Just before he makes that statement, he talks about how we know, and I'm paraphrasing here, that we know uh, Iraq is aggressively seeking nuclear weapons. And how do we know that? Because defectors uh, with first-hand knowledge have told us that. And they include Saddam's son-in-law. Well, when I went back and reread that, I said, wait a minute, that's not what Hussein Kamal said. He actually said exactly the opposite. And so we wrote this, uh, and at the same time queried the vice president's office about how is it that the vice president says one thing, and yet it's uh, he's. Uh, how is it that that the vice president is claiming Hussein Kamal said one thing when in fact this transcript has him saying exactly the opposite? And I believe the reply was somewhere along the lines, "Well, there are other sources of information," but you know I'm kind of dubious. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the uh, Reuters had uh, picked up the story on, and asked Bill Harlow, the CIA. He denied that there was any existence of this document or that it was even there. And then it, the story died after, I mean, it, would, it was originated in Newsweek and it came out, Reuters picked it up, and then nothing else happened with it. And so it was out there. And so do you think, I mean, I guess from your perspective, you were in Iraq, right? So you didn't, 
did you hear about it in Iraq? Even we had we had access to a lot of stuff. Yeah, we had, you know, up in north, up in the north, they've got satellite internet cafes, and so I was able to have access to a lot of stuff. Uh, I do somewhat recall that story, uh, I, but I can't talk about what happened here because I wasn't here and I wasn't able to follow it. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you give a kind of overview of the aluminum tubes? Um, issue from when it first broke in early September and what you were able to discover? M my recollection is that it was broken in the New York Times. Um, and my recollection is that, that um, on the Sunday talks that day, I believe, both Vice President Cheney and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice both pointed to the article. Uh, as a way of being able to skirt around the restrictions they were under uh, to discuss classified, discussing classified information. Um, and at that point, I don't think anybody was questioning this story except perhaps David Albright uh, and, and Michael Massing in his piece in the New York Review of Books does a very nice job in, in kind of reporting that whole, that whole history. I only got into it uh, when the CIA published this unclassified assessment of uh, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program, and again, uh, you know, it, there was this litany of allegations that we had heard for almost years. Um, and then, in the midst of this, reading myself, reading that there was a, there was um, a dispute between experts uh, within the intelligence community over the nature of these tubes and that in fact some experts believed that they were actually for ground-to-ground -ground rockets. Um, that jumped up at me and I wrote the story that way. Um, and, and in reporting the story I was able to get to um, a man who had been involved in the US centrifuge program uh, for years uh, who had also had access to data that had been uh, produced from the examinations of the tubes uh, and he said these are not for uh, centrifuges and um, and I said why and he said well because they're anodized on the outside uh, they in other words the, the, the outside coating is makes them extremely smooth uh, very aerodynamic and it's much more likely they're for ground-to-ground -ground rockets because they had this coating on them than for centrifuges. He also told me that it was the wrong type of aluminum, that the aluminum was not suitable for the production of centrifuges. Now, in retrospect, what we learned later on um, uh, was that, in fact, the dissent on the nature of the tubes was quite extensive, and it was shared by the one place that is the repository of U.S knowledge of centrifuge technology and that's the Department of Energy. The other place where there was dissent was the Intelligence and Research Bureau at the State Department and both their dissents were based on um, an analysis and examination of the tubes that were conducted by one of the US nuclear labs and my understanding of what, what happened was that this nuclear lab and I think it was Sandia, I'm not sure, actually took these tubes and spun them at, at, at the, the incredible rates of speed that centrifuges operate at, and they, they fell apart. They disintegrated. They could not withstand, they buckled, they could not withstand uh, this high speed rotation. Uh, and hence their descent, uh, based on analysis that was done by the U.S. by a U.S. nuclear lab. If you read the the, uh, the report that the CIA, the unclassified report the CIA put out, what they said is um, that a majority of analysts believe that these tubes were for, um, uh, could, be, could be used as centrifuges. But my question is, who is that majority? Does that, is that majority simply a majority of, of uh, experts who sat down at a table, uh, representatives of, of, of the intelligence agencies sitting down at the table and voting and voting or was this a majority of of metallurgists 
people who are highly have high degrees of knowledge about uh, engineering, about centrifuges, metallurgy. I doubt that that's what it was. I believe it was probably the first. So do you think that there was um, political pressure exerted on I can't the say. I can't say if there was political pressure or not. I cannot say. Okay. And um, uh, in that particular, I cannot say that there was political pressure in that particular instance. But you can say there's political pressure on other. We've reported that there has been political pressure applied to some analysts in, in various forms. It's not doesn't take the form of, uh, you know, you will do this. Uh, but our understanding is it goes somewhere along the lines of, well, that's interesting. That's an interesting way that you have portrayed this data, but couldn't you do it this way? And if you're a senior enough person who's saying to a, you know, a, a GS8, a GS9, couldn't you look at it this way? Are, as, are you as a GS8 or a GS9, GS10 going to say no? Okay. And um, uh, a trend that's happening now is the uh, politically this may be off your beat, but that there's, um, with the administration is using a human rights justification to say we're, you know, we're deposing of an evil dictator. How do you, how does that play in, how does that argument play into, um, you know, how, how do you see it and how does it play into your coverage? You know, if you go back to all the speeches that were made on Iraq, there's, there is a component there of how, of this man's horrendous, uh, cataclysmic human rights record. They, they make references to it. But it's not their chief justification for war. Their chief justification for war was the specter of a mushroom cloud, a nuclear weapon uh, designed and made by Iraq being used against the United States. That was the justification for war. And in all of the case speeches that I've read, the human rights argument is not the primary argument. Okay. Um, the um, Iraqi Liberation Act of uh, 1998, um, have you read that? Oh, sure. Many times. Um, can you speak to um, the last section eight, the rules of construction, talking about, you know, the bounds of which this the act was supposed to be used in regards to the use of ar ar United States Armed Forces? Um, I can't sp talk specifically to that. Um, I mean, what I can talk to is the fact that this act, which the Clinton administration signed under political pressure, uh, was the result of very intense, serious lobbying uh, by Iraqi opposition groups, particularly the Iraqi National Congress here in Washington, and by their allies. Uh, outside the government and indeed in Congress. Uh, it was written, it was a document that was written in Congress by uh, people who were, by a person who was very, very close to Ahmed Chalabi, uh, who went on to, his name is Randy Schooneman, uh, he went on to uh, head uh, the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, um, and the obvious the obvious intent of this uh, bill was to aid not just the Iraqi National Congress but other Iraqi groups in trying to overthrow Saddam. Uh, at that time, the Iraqi National Congress, Ahmed Chalabi, was promoting a plan that came to be known as the Chalabi Plan, which did have call for a very um, prominent role for U.S. air power in protecting an enclave. Uh, uh, an opposition enclave in Iraq, and I believe that that's sort of where this act was really going. So let me let me just read that for you real quick and see if you have any reactions. The uh, section eight um, rules rule of construction: nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize or otherwise speak to the use of United States armed forces in carrying out this act. Do you see that the that that part of the act was ignored and the regime changed? Was oh, no. No, not at all. Um, I don't think it was... It, that, that 
that's kind of what we call weasel language because it doesn't bar them from using American armed forces. It doesn't there's no prohibition. It just says that this act shouldn't be used as a uh, an authorization, but it doesn't say U.S. armed forces are going to be pro are prohibited from taking action in Iraq. No, that that's a presidential decision that has to be a, usually is approved by a congressional separate complete separate congressional vote. And what they I guess that language is intended to do is to basically say this is not. This, this, the, the vote on this act, the passage of this act, does not represent a vote authorizing, a vote by Congress authorizing the use of military force. I guess the, the, the blurring of that line comes in when Ari Fleischer is saying our policy is, is regime change. But wait a minute, but you know, the fact is that, that the Clinton administration signed that bill, and that bill's policy makes it the pol that, that bill made it the policy of the United States to change the regime in Iraq. And, and it was something that the Clinton administration signed, Bill Clinton signed, uh, not Bush. And so the policy of regime change was established under the Clinton administration. So Ari's right. Well, it says the sense of Congress regarding, it's a sense of Congress lading, a language that says it should be the policy of the United States. It isn't saying that it is the policy. And when I went back to read the the actual um, floor debates, there was actually a debate over that specific hmm. issue where uh, Ron Paul or uh, Lee Hamilton is saying in defense of that that um, we should not, we should have no illusions about the bill. Let us be very clear about what the bill does and does not do. The bill states the sense of Congress. It does not change U.S. policy. Ron Paul disagrees and he says that. Um, I would I'd like to challenge that statement that it doesn't change it because it should be the policy. And he says it sounds pretty clear. And Lee Hamilton comes back to say, I think the gentleman from Texas questioned my statement a moment ago in which I said that the bill states a sense of Congress that does not change U.S. policy. I believe my statement is correct for a couple of reasons. The language in the bill is only sense of Congress. It does not say what the policy is. It says what the policy should be. Yeah, but again, this is what I called we weasel language. I mean, they're really famous for that kind of thing here in Washington, where you know you're looking f to strike a political compromise that that uh, satisfies both sides, that both sides can interpret in w the way they want to interpret it. Uh, and in this case, I believe the Clinton administration interpreted it as U.S. policy. Okay, and um, can you speak to Ahmed uh, Chalabi and? Uh, what the DIA had, had kind of their assessments or him being a, a fabricator and at what point did Well, they no, they never test him as being a fabricator, no. They're the uh, Iraqi National Congress Intelligence. What, well, there was, what they, what, they, what they determined was, first of all, uh, and there were actually two reviews. There was one done by them and there's one done uh, by uh, um, and a, a, a how would you put it, by, by the National Intelligence Council, which is, or the NIC, which is a, an advisory group uh, of very prominent experts uh, uh, under, that, that report to uh, George Tenet. And uh, my understanding is that in both cases, um, both reviews, uh, formal, and I believe one was formal and one was sort of an informal look. I don't know that they were kind of really structured but my understanding is that both reviews concluded that the information that was provided by these defectors uh, was marginal at best, most of it useless, and that some of this, these defectors were fabricators and, or exaggerators or had been coached to say what they had said. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, late... October, uh, New York Times broke the Office of Special Plans um, that this special unit... A day before is, us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so why don't you speak to that? Well, actually, they actually no. They, what they, they, they didn't actually break that story. What they broke was uh, the creation of this intelligence uh, analysis cell that was uh, under Douglas Fife, the Undersecretary of, of Defense for Policy, that had gone back to look at uh, connections between uh, state states and terrorist groups. Uh, what the article didn't report and what we did the next day, and we were working on it at the same time, um, was that information that was being used by 
this unit also included stuff that was coming from the Iraqi National Congress uh, and that stuff that, that the regular intelligence a, uh, agencies like the CIA wanted nothing to do with. Uh, and that then, then that the product, as it's called, the product uh, or the report was then uh, provided to the White House. Um, and, in, and we now know it was actually briefed to Secretary Rumsfeld uh, and to CIA Director George Tennant. And we also know that now, we didn't know it at the time, uh, that even the Department of Defense officially disavowed what this report said, and, 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 or the material in this report, it disavowed this material as being conclusive evidence that there was connections, there were, that, that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden were working together to kill Americans. Okay. Um, so when you take a look back during the, the pre-war time period, um, how do you assess the, the media's performance and what they could have done better? Well, I think the media's performance generally was was woeful, absolutely woeful. They, for the most part, acted as conveyor belts of administration information, information that we now know had some pretty major problems with it, uh, and nobody, very nobody outside of Knight Ritter, us. Uh, and maybe, and I haven't done a review, but I think you need to talk to Michael Massing about what he found. But I don't think anybody, that's making a, that's, that's a pretty broad statement. Let me just say, most of the media failed miserably in assessing the administration's justification for going to war in Iraq. And uh, how could they have done it differently? Done what we did. And that is... Here's, here's the justifications. Let's examine them. Let's see what's true and what's not. They could have done it by doing their job. And, I, 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 you know, it was pretty lonely out there for a very long time. Um, what kind of stories after October was um, Night Ritter looking at as far as the intelligence? What kind of other... Uh, after what? Uh, we, October. Uh, um, after... When I was just when I, on your um, on your website, you have a special uh, on Real Cities. There's a special coverage from yeah. Iraq, and it goes through and it it, it, has, it goes right up to last week. Well, well, I mean, um, I'm I'm looking at from um, August 26th to March 19th. Okay, so there's you mean of O2 of O2 right uh, of O2 up to O3. So there's nine six O two ten four O two. Oh yeah. Eight, I mean we have ten twenty seven yeah, okay. and then twelve twenty oh two. So what I'm asking is from twelve twenty oh two to March nineteenth. We we did some actually some very groundbreaking stuff. Uh and perhaps the most important was uh the Office of Special Plans at the Pentagon and um the failure to plan for what happened in Iraq. Uh, the fact that they planned for stuff that never happened. And with the intention of of getting making making it possible for Ahmed Chalabi to replace Saddam Hussein. Uh, now they will they dispute that rigorously, but I can tell you that virtually everyone else you'll talk to who was involved in that process, involved in the planning, will verify that. As did Richard Pearl who was then the chairman of the Defense Policy Board, in an interview with us in that very same story. We said, yes, absolutely, and it's not, and it's the CIA and the State Department's fault that this, that this whole thing failed, because they didn't back that planning. They didn't back the goal of basically shaving off the top layer of the regime uh, and, and replacing it with uh, Ahmed Chalabi and the INC, um, a, a, a man who pledged publicly to signing a peace treaty with Israel and a man who had promised to allow U.S. bases to be located in Iraq after the overthrow of Saddam. Uh, do you see that uh, shifting the military footprint into Iraq was um, um, a motivation or just a consequence? It depends. I mean, I think that the various people who were involved in this had various motivations. Um, for some of them, yes. 
getting the military, getting a major U.S. presence uh, in the so-called, right in the slap bang in the middle of what's known as the arc of instability, this arc of instability that, that, that across the, the, the Islam, largely across the Islamic world, absolutely was one of the motivations of some people who were involved in this. Hmm. And when you're... Uh, and, and they've succeeded. Um, so, have you looked at uh, some of the projects for New American Century? Uh, no, I, I'm well aware of the documents, yes. Okay. Um, so, it, when, you're, when you explain to people why the Iraq War happened, what would you say? It depends on whose motivations you're talking about. I think there were a bunch of motivations involved, all of which sort of cult came together. I mean, they were all self-reinforcing. Uh, getting U.S. bases in the arc of instability, um, getting Saddam Hussein out of power, uh, perhaps genuinely because people believed he had weapons of mass destruction, and they really were genuine concerns that he could give them to terrorists. But I think the fact that he was still in power, uh, you know, how many years after George Bush, the f first President George Bush, left office. Um, uh, I also think people talk about the motive of oil being a motivation. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, my take on that would be. It wasn't an effort to control oil. It was an effort to ensure that nobody controlled oil, that it remained a free-flowing commodity uh, because um, uh, oil, the oil market is, is such a fungible, oil is such a fungible commodity now that, you know, even if you, that if you stop oil flow anywhere in the world, it will impact prices of oil coming out from other parts of the world. So the idea is you don't want anybody, Saddam Hussein, to be able to control the flow of oil. You want it to remain an, a, an uncontrolled, open market. So I think that was probably more a motivation than some idea that the United States wanted to go in and take control of, of the world's second largest repository for oil. Um, uh, so you... So, so I think you had, then I think there was also this concern about uh, the security of, of American troops in Saudi, got to get them out of Saudi. Uh, that gives motivation to uh, extremists like bin Laden, gives a justification for, or it gives them a justification for waging jihad. Um, and it gets American troops closer to the areas that the administration believe they should be closer to. Um, if you read books that are out there now, particularly the one by the former, you know, in, uh, the, the one featuring the former Treasury Secretary, Paul O'Neill, it's quite clear that this was on the agenda, that Iraq was on the agenda uh, before 9-11, that they came into office with the intent of regime change. Some of them, some, some senior members of this administration. Uh, and so I don't think you have to look very far to find the reasons for the war. Okay, uh, let me just do a quick look over here. Um, oh, can you talk about the collaboration process um, that you were kind of engaged with, with other beats? Um, a lot of the stories I see the byline, there's a lot of names. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we, we work very closely together, uh, three of us, four of us actually. Uh, most of the stories have been done by, by Warren Strobel and myself. Warren is the the diplomatic writer. I do national security. Our beats kind of overlap from that regard. Uh, and then John Walcott, who is the bureau chief, uh, who has been reporting national security for years here in Washington. He worked the Pentagon for Newsweek uh, and uh, I believe uh, the State Department for um, the Wall Street Journal, but also wrote a book on terrorism, terrorism in the 1980s. Um, and so has very, very good sources. And then our senior military writer, Joe Galloway, uh, who has his own sources. And Joe, I don't think there's anybody who knows the American military the way Joe does. Joe was the co-author of We Were Soldiers Once and Young. So he's been covering 
the mil U.S. military since Vietnam. And we all have different sources. We all have different ac access to different types of information. And so, you know, we have the, the two source rule here, which is you get something, you got to get a second source on it, at least a second source. And I got to tell you that up to this point in um, 18 months of reporting, uh, not many people have come back, act back to us to say you got this wrong.